welcome to the second part of the lectures on the stiffness methods. On these chapters, we will try to cover on the cost outcome number one, which we try to apply some of the mathematical knowledge, science and engineering to solve for our problem. So what is stiffness method? Okay, so we will talk about stiffness methods today, right? The concept behind the stiffness method. As we have uh, used to know, many mechanical systems can be modeled through a spring mass, right? So here, the stiffness methods will, intro will be introduced using what we call a linear spring. Okay, so this linear spring as this cost is all about a, a finite element. So we will use this spring itself to represent an element, right? So you can see that this is a finite element model which we have meshed through various various uh, elements, okay? And every single element itself can be represented by let's say a spring. Right, so here we use a linear spring, okay. So by using this linear spring, we will uh, go across the steps, okay, in the finite element methods, okay, so that you know what is happening behind the finite element uh, analysis, okay. We will consider the derivations of the stiffness matrix for a linear elastic spring elements okay as we say elements right and from this uh, stiffness matrix later on we will form a total stiffness matrix which comprise of an assemblage okay a combinations of spring elements as we can see this is one single spring element we can combine to model for the whole uh, yeah, for for the whole uh, finite element uh, models right to check okay or to analyze for the whole assembled uh, systems the total stiffness matrix itself for an assemblage is obtained by combining or superimpose those stiffness matrices of the individual elements in the very direct methods okay just add or minus it right and then later on from there we will add okay after we assemble all the matrices okay then later on only we will add the boundary conditions okay to the assembled uh, equations or assembled matrix okay in order for them to solve okay so you can see that the steps is we first model them okay into a finite element model then from there every single element itself will be represented by a stiffness matrix and then in the software itself when we start to analyze it we start to assemble all the matrix then only we apply all the constraint to the equations then solve the equation simultaneously to find the forces and complete the analysis so this is a simple uh, equation that we used to represent a spring. We know that the force equals to the kx, right? So the k itself is the stiffness of a spring or a constant of a spring. And then the d is the maybe the, the elongation itself, the d, right? This represents by the d matrix and the force, okay? So f equals to kx. Very simple uh, uh, linear elastic spring model right so from this single model itself we slowly assemble it okay into a, again a, a matrices okay a total stiffness matrices okay in this form okay we have summations of all the forces okay equals to the total stiffness matrix okay multiplied by all the uh, displacement or changes okay in the elongations okay of the the all the elements or the assemblage itself right so come to the stiffness matrix okay so the stiffness, stiffness matrix is defined 
uh, as follow for a single element okay for a single linear element okay spring element itself okay the stiffness matrix is represented by the bracket k a small k all right to represent one uh, spring element right so we will use f equals to kd right where the k relates the knot displacement and the knot or the nodal uh, force right so you may have a forces acting on this red color is the knot right and the spring itself we call it as an element right for for a single element there is two knot right and all the forces will act not on the spring but at the knot itself okay the red dot itself when we combine them to form a series of elements okay we can form a so-called assemblage itself and then from there we will see a bigger or a larger form of stiffness matrix okay we call it as bracket capital k okay that relates to the global coordinates of x y z so you may have x y z instead of in this form uh, the easiest way to describe this we be maybe we will just use a single direction x right okay but then when we combine it okay then this would have their on x okay for this spring okay there will be another have another x okay for the other spring so when we combine them itself we will want to represent them into a, a easier to to combine form right meaning to say we will have a global uh, coordinate system which represent x y and then there is z right so instead of using individual uh, coordinate system for every single element when we combine them we will use a global coordinate system okay that's given as such right? okay so and this stiffness matrix for a global form or the total stiffness matrix we relate the global coordinates nodal displacement for every single node itself okay to the global forces acting on the whole structure okay given by again the similar form of the equations right here is the derivations of a stiffness matrix for a spring element right so now we start with the spring element okay later on you will see we keep repeating the same uh, derivation methods but we would start to slowly define uh, from a single spring element okay we will move on to several chapters go through maybe from a beam okay spring then we go to beam to a bar to a quadrilateral elements and so on right so we start with the concept of a spring element very simple example first right so in the spring elements we always say that the spring obeys Hooke's law right so when we say it obeys Hooke's law meaning to say it react in a proportional way okay represented by the straight line of the material right so that's why in most of the final element uh, software they have no problem to model on the uh, linear part of the stress strain curve or graph okay but they may have a problem to deal with these characteristics because the element itself may not be able to model this particular characteristics okay this is a non-linear characteristics okay whereas for this part it is very similar to the Hooke's law okay where it uh, is everything is proportional so therefore the characteristic of these elongations is straightforward we can represent it with uh, f equals to kx uh, equations right so for now we just focus on this uh, linear part Okay, or the proportional parts of the stress strain curve right so we use a spring to model it right and the spring have a stiffness matrix of k and at this node we label it with node number one and node number two okay at these two nodes we may have uh, forces acting on it okay along the directions of the spring and there is another forces let's say on the same directions with a force f2x okay so we have a force acting in at knot number one and there is force acting at knot number two 
along the x directions okay or the uh, along the springs uh, directions okay the original length of the spring is given by l okay and after some times okay let's say after due to the forces itself then the knot number one will have a displacement of u1 let's say okay and at the knot number two there will be another displacement of number two okay u2 that's why we call that as a local nodal displacement okay u1 u2 right so you, you lo label every single node itself with different displacement as well as different forces okay we call it local localized at the particular node itself right then nodal displacement are called as the degree of freedom at the node okay so let's say it, this node itself it only allows uh, movement in the x direction therefore there is only one degree of freedom right at this particular point okay at node number two there is another one degree of freedom so total for this element there is two degree of freedom right so they will may move this way and this way okay which is still in the same directions okay so based on that particular concept of a spring okay basically by using the stiffness uh, methods okay stiffness method we can extend it to various uh, applications okay as we have mentioned previously uh, we will start with spring and later on we will grow into maybe a bar okay or maybe not only bar we will go across different type of uh, applications that involve maybe heat transfer okay heat conductions or maybe in fluid right so all these uh, application itself we can still apply the spring or the stiffness concept or methods okay we just have to get what is the k value okay where for a prismatic bar we may use the k value equals to a e over l for a uh, heat uh, conductions one dimensional uh, systems we may represent the k a equals to a k over l right where the k is represented the thermal conductivity of the material all right maybe for a fluid very similar okay but then instead of thermal conductivity we may use the permissivity coefficients of the material less okay so meaning to say if we able to represent the spring constant or the stiffness of the spring with the relevance equations or relationships okay between the applications of the elements okay let's say this is bar or maybe heat transfer or torsional part right therefore the same equations will apply and we can use it to to identify different uh, uh, results okay at the end of the analysis okay so now we will go through on the seven steps of a finite element methods right so first thing uh, when we start okay we will want to define our elements okay here as we have say we will start with spring today right so we just represent our spring type or, or the element type as a spring linear spring elements okay so in the spring itself okay we just denote that with a not number one not number two right and there is uh, an axis okay along the spring okay we call that as x axis okay so after we label it then we should know what is the original length okay before any deformations right so once we know that we will start to assign that this spring itself will have a, a spring constant given by k okay so this k actually represent the material property of the element right so remember uh, this material property can be uh, young modulus it can be uh, poison ratio it can be thermal conductivity or whatever relevance that we have uh, seen previously okay in the previous slide right so it depends on what kind of uh, applications or analysis that you are going to uh, apply later on right so let's take this uh, for examples okay so we have defined our elements okay and when we start to derive okay it 
then we will start to assign let's say attention to the spring element okay so in order to give attention then we means we will apply a force okay we pull them apart all right so there is a, a force t okay acting on the uh, separate directions okay the, or different directions okay so that they we can pull them uh away okay to stretch the spring right so when we stretch it okay then again uh, not number one may move a little bit okay not number two will move a little bit okay we, we denote that as, as u1 and u2 right so now after we have uh, defined our spring element okay in this case we will start to now select what we call as a displacement function right so this displacement functions will uh, is a mathematical functions okay to represent how this element itself okay in this case is the spring element how this spring element will change shape right we call it as displacement we change shapes okay when we apply it with a load or a tension or any force it is okay so this is what we call as displacement function okay how they will change in terms of displacement or shape okay of the elements under loading okay under forces okay so now here we will assume a uh, solution shapes okay or distributions uh, of displacement within the elements okay usually by mathematical functions again okay and most common uh, functions are a polynomial right polynomial right so remember if you still remember in the previous uh, lecture that we talked about there is a linear elements there is a quadratic elements right with a knot in between so that would represent the kind of mathematical uh, functions okay being applied to our finite element itself right so we don't move too far away from there first okay to avoid you being confused okay so we start to derive for our displacement functions right so here we will choose a displacement functions u okay to represent how the displacement will change across the spring element here okay so we will represent with this u okay so at node number one we have displacement u1 at node number two we have displacement u2 but in between there is a relationship right so and we will represent that with a displacement function u okay so we have u equals to here since uh, this very straightforward okay this uh, linear linear form of uh, changes across the spring we will use a linear form of uh, equations to represent our displacement functions right so we have a1 plus a2 x okay just a linear equations right linear form or linear displacement variations right and the idea behind why we select this linear displacements okay actually is depending on the total number of degree of freedom right so you have a1 and a2 right so how many degree of freedom for this uh, linear spring as we say at node number one we have only one movement okay along this way okay at node number two we have another movement along this way right so basically we have two degree of freedom to represent this particular spring element therefore we have a1 a2 okay two degree of freedom okay and that's where we will use a1 plus a2 x okay if there is more than that then we may want to add plus a3 x square and so on okay to form a polynomial right okay so using this uh, linear displacement functions to represent the displacement across the spring okay now we would want to know what is the a1 and a2 right so in order to get a1 and a2 we will use the information at u1 as well as u2 okay to form our relationship okay so basically at not number one okay at not number one here okay at not number one here this is u1 okay and we know that u1 
is when the u functions okay is at the length of the zero okay let's take this as x axis right and this spring element have a length of l right so we would put l over here and zero over here right we start from this point okay zero to l right so at not number one means the u when the length is zero okay the displacement would be u1 right we know that at not number one is u1 right so once we know this is u1 okay we just represent we just put this is okay let's put this clear right so this is a u functions a eh, u u as a functions of x right so when x equals to zero we put zero over here right therefore a1 equals to u1 right so we get these equations right then for the displacement at node number two where we say u at the length of l you know right at this particular point this u l is actually equals to the u2 okay so we have this relationship okay so we, we represent the x as l right so we have a2 l plus a1 okay we already get a1 as u1 so we put u1 over here rearrange our equation we get the a2 equals to u2 minus u1 divided by l right so we just rearrange our equation we get this okay so once we get this now just put them back then eventually we get u the displacement function is equals to u1 plus u2 minus u1 divided by l multiplied by x okay so this is how we get the displacement function for a spring right so next is that for now we will still continue to use uh, this form right to see to easily uh, visualize what is happening in the in the uh, derivations of the equation itself okay but then in real okay we would want to simplify them into a matrix form okay we can put them as the u equals to this is one u1 right so one u1 okay we just uh, put them into a form of one okay then this is x okay whereas the u1 is the a1 okay this is a2 right so in this particular form okay so this is the matrix form of this particular displacement functions okay in, we will revisit that uh, matrix in the step three and four later on right okay so now we continue by using the basic equation first right so here after we get u1 plus u2 minus u1 divided by l multiplied by x equals to u okay we can further rearrange them okay to uh to show that okay as a functions of u1 and u2 all right so we can rearrange them in this way okay so such that u is ex expressed as u1 and u2 okay so again we can form our matrices okay this is in matrix okay so this is in matrix such that the u1 multiply by this particular okay this multiply by this okay plus this multiply by this will give us the u right the u values okay? so this is in the matrix form right and in this matrix form itself this particular part we can uh, denote that as n1 this we can denote that as n2 okay so n1 and n2 now we give a name we call it as a shape function right so n1 and n2 is the shape functions of the this spring element right so what this spring functions tells us is that it represents the shape of the uh, assumed displacement when one of the 
elements degree of freedom is set to one and the rest is set to zero okay that is the the idea of the shape functions right so what it means is that when we only consider u1 eh, yeah when we only consider u1 then only n1 will respond at the u1 okay so u1 at u1 itself it have a unit of one okay maximum one okay but then it will slowly decrease okay where the other uh, degree of freedom at u2 is set to zero therefore it will slowly gradually drop to zero right when we use the n2 you will see that n2 is representing the the u2 therefore the u2 at this particular point is at the maximum one okay you need one right but then it slowly decreased to the other side right so therefore you can see that this n2 is actually representing this particular line okay this n1 is representing this particular line okay one minus x minus l right so this two itself what we can see is it's actually com is representing this whole particular displacement across the spring okay remember you have at one okay not number one and not number two right so this part represent this part okay and this part is actually represented by this part okay? so when you sum them up together okay it's actually give you the whole uh, total displacement across the spring right so therefore by combining them together it gives us this total therefore we say that the n1 plus n2 must equals to 1 okay no matter how it is okay it must equals to 1 1 represent the unit 1 unit right 1 unit meaning to say the total length right 1 unit okay so for any axial coordinates the shape functions n1 plus n2 must be equals to 1 okay and the n1 we can also call them as an interpolation function okay instead of shape functions okay because it's give us the interpolations or the values of the uh, functions in between two nodes right so when this triangle plus this angle okay with a unit one okay so if let's say this is zero zero line okay this is the blue color and this is the purple color right so when you add them up they will always give you one no matter where it is okay no matter which point you 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 total them up they must satisfy this uh, conditions right so after we have uh, defined the displacement functions and in from the displacement function we uh, form the shape functions okay displacement function shape functions okay then slowly now we start to build the relationship or define the relationship between the stress strain or displacement as well yeah and the stress strain right this is important to tell the system or the mathematical functions okay to to analyze okay in a more meaningful way okay because the what we have defined previously is only displacement right so we must relate the displacement with strain as well as stress okay based on our uh, knowledge on the material property right so from there we will able to uh, further relate all of them right so now from the spring element okay instead of force okay we will now start start to use another uh, symbol to define the force okay so we use t as the tensile force okay that uh, produce a, a total changes or elongations okay as a delta all right delta okay so spring or net not number one they may displace okay displace certain regions okay u1 okay at node number two they will displace again at the certain uh, range of u2 okay even though this is original so this is let's say this is a deformed uh, spring okay 
under the the application of load t right so the total displacement uh, the, the dis deformation of the spring can be given by u2 minus u1 right u2 minus u1 all right i think this should be here right so my u2 minus u1 right so this one move here this one move here so total is u2 minus u1 and the uh, stress strain relationship okay later on we can again get the relationship that we say force equals to the spring coefficient multiplied by the displacement right or the deformations okay so we just represent them in this way right it's the same uh, equations with the uh, the spring force and deformations uh, relationships equations all right now further onwards okay we will start to look into the knot okay so at knot number one okay there is a force one okay acting in this way given by the force t okay and this t is acting at the negative direction so negative directions right so eventually we will replace this as minus t right okay then on the other side okay not number two the force is acting on these directions with a value of t so eventually later on we will apply this as t right so this this minus t and t will be our boundary condition when you define the the loading itself okay but for time being okay during this derivation the computer will just assemble them without replacing this value of minus t and t first okay they will assemble everything then later on they will slowly insert it right that would be the next step okay but for our illustration we will want to see that actually this f1x is minus t and this f2x is t right and then at the same time at this particular point okay since the u1 is moving this way then you will have the f1x equals to k u1 minus u2 okay on the other side is the reverse way u2 minus u1 okay because this whole spring will move okay u1 a little bit therefore the whole changes is u2 minus u1 right so same thing on the other side okay just reverse it so if we want to now form the matrix okay this is very important now right previously we just use the equations right but then when we have many nodes okay every node will have one one equations okay every single node itself will have one single equations then it's the best if we can form them into a matrix okay we call this as an element stiffness matrix right so to form this element stiffness matrix we just use f1 here okay k this is ku okay minus k okay, sorry ku1 minus ku2 so eventually we see that the u1 the k is positive for the u2 the k is negative because minus k right so therefore for get f1x is k u1 right k u1 minus k u2 right so this gives us these equations whereas for the f2x same thing k minus u1 so so it, uh, therefore is minus k u1 plus k u2 right k u2 so therefore you can see that the stiffness matrix for this particular element will have this form okay k k minus k minus k right we call this as a symmetric okay symmetric square matrix okay because they are symmetrical right so this diagonal they are symmetry right along this diagonal so we call this as a local stiffness matrix small k right and we have successfully derived the element stiffness for a single element right remember we only start with a single element all right 
So next is we would want to combine them together. If we have more than one, right? We would want to combine them together. And that is where we would want to form, we call that as a global stiffness matrix, okay? And the global force matrix, okay? So the global stiffness matrix can be combined by the summations of all the stiffness matrix of every single element so if let's, let's say you have three elements so you have from element number one number two number three you total them up together to form this uh, matrix okay when we mean what when what we mean by total them up together or to form this is that let's say you have a k1 okay k number one the matrix is k k minus k and minus k right right but then if you this is represent the x and y axis let's say okay then you may have the z axis so this may be zero 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 right then you have another elements okay number two element number two and when you combine this one this one if let's it may have zero k minus k okay and then zero 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 okay so zero zero this is zero minus k and k right so you may have this form zero 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 k minus k zero minus k k right so this is the elements for so when we total them up or when we combine them up okay this big uh, global stiffness matrix will become k minus k and then this one zero zero right so every single elements in the matrix we are now this one minus k right then this k and this k then we have two k right zero and minus k you have minus k right and so on so every single uh elements in the matrix okay again we use the elements all right in the matrix itself we just total them up right so to form the so-called global stiffness matrix all right so this is what happened at this stage right assembling matrix okay in the software itself they assemble all this if you have 1000 elements they will assemble it into a maybe 1000 times 1000 matrix okay you have 1000 line here 1000 line elements here right 1000 if you have 1 million elements then you just form the particular elements in the in the matrix way okay in the in the form of matrix right so next is that we will start to apply the constraint when we mean uh applying the constraint meaning to say we are imposing the boundary condition for example the support condition uh, certain not okay we may say uh, this not uh, will not move okay because it is being supported okay or fixed to a particular point so in that type in that condition we will start to replace at not number maybe not number three the u is equals to zero okay we will apply zero okay for that particular uh not okay or maybe at certain not the the force acting on it is t then we start to put t okay into our equation remember we say this okay f1 okay is minus t and t okay this is where it will start to being uh replace or start to being imposed into our matrix okay previously we just formed the general form okay but then we slowly impose it okay into our equations all right certain not we have zero displacement or maybe a fixed displacement right so this is where we start to uh, apply our boundary conditions okay after we assemble the matrix right after assemble matrix we start to apply the constraint right so the software will start start to put in value that whatever they know 
okay then after we have put in all the values that they may know okay because we define it we say this point cannot move okay this point only can rotate this point uh, will have a force acting on it right so that will be our conditions or constraint so once we have formed that now the software will try to solve the matrix okay solve them simultaneously okay it's a system of equations okay you have one uh, for example previously okay in the sp one single uh, spring element there is two equations right to solve simultaneously if you have one one thousand elements then you may have one thousand and one uh, equations to solve simultaneously right so now questions maybe we will start to ask how computers solve equations simultaneously remember why this is where uh, it explain why we want to use or uh, to represent them into matrix okay matrix give us a way to to solve uh, things uh, simultaneously by repeating the same step okay I believe you have uh, come across this previously in the subject called numerical methods okay numerical methods is basically solving mathematics Okay. using a very systematic way right you just keep repeating it right so the computer will actually use a very famous uh, methods newton Raphson iterations right so when we talk about newton Raphson iterations then you your mind will come across like uh, if you start to converge okay so that's why that is where the fea software will sometimes tells you convergence fail right so you may see all these terms okay but human you can solve it right okay but for a computer they will start to iterate by putting a initial guess okay they start to iterate okay until the value converge right they will not say they find the exact solution they only say the the solution have been converge right so this is where it comes with all these terms right convergence fails and so on right so after that Okay, after we have solved for the displacement, remember what we get here. Okay, these equations only tells us the displacement, right? Okay, because we have applied all the forces at different node, right? So it will get us to the displacement of every single node, all right? So based on the displacement, now we can reapply it. Okay, we resubstitute them back to the previous equation to find what is the force acting on the on each of the element okay and that is where we are finding the reaction force okay so after we find all this reaction force then this force can be translated into maybe stress okay therefore you can see i in the first assignment i asked you to try to look for the displacement and then check the result of the one misses stress right so these stresses actually come from the force okay force divided by area give you stress okay so this is where you you will start to calculate every single knot itself okay to tell uh, what is the forces acting or what is the stress acting on the so-called elements or the knot itself Okay, so after it successfully finding all these forces, then the analysis has been completed. All right, so we can finish. All right, I guess uh I will stop here for today. Okay, because uh I believe now you may have a lot of uh terms to recall. Okay, what happens to all this uh, stiffness matrix okay then there is terms like um, matrices elements local node right then from there also there is a uh, displacement functions shape functions okay so if you you will start to 
play around with all these terms okay in your mind right so i will stop here for now okay we will you should take a simple quiz okay uh that will be available in the google classroom all right or you just follow this link okay so when you go into it so make sure you register using your student email right so once you answer it it will collect your your uh, email address okay okay and that email address you you have your your student metrics over there okay so from there i know who is answering okay very simple objective questions three questions okay that relate with what we have presented previously right so that's all for today see you again we will continue again on the next uh monday right so that's all bye bye